Hey everyone, my name is Brady Witten, and this is The Word Meets the World for February 23rd, 2022. So the Mardi Gras season has begun in South Louisiana. King cakes have been on store shelves for weeks, and parties and parades will continue through Mardi Gras Day on Tuesday, March 1st. Now Mardi Gras is French for Fat Tuesday, and it's a reference to the practice of eating rich, fatty foods the day before Ash Wednesday, which marks the beginning of the season of Lent. Now some people love Mardi Gras and relish the season of celebration and community. Others see it as a time of excess and immorality that should be avoided by those who call themselves Christian. But what does the Bible have to say about all this? What does the Bible say about Mardi Gras? That's our topic for this week's The Word Meets the World. So what does the Bible say about Mardi Gras? So the tradition of Mardi Gras has direct ties to the Christian observance of Lent, which is a 40-day period of penance and fasting preceding the celebration of Easter. On the first day of Lent, known as Ash Wednesday, many Christians begin abstaining from certain foods. And in medieval Europe, the tradition developed to hold a feast day the day before Ash Wednesday, which became known as Fat Tuesday. So this tradition blossomed in Rome and Venice in the 17th century. And in the 18th century, when French Canadian explorers settled what is now Alabama and Florida, they brought the practice with them. But what does the Bible say about all this? So although the Bible does not establish the season of Lent, it does tell us that Jesus spent 40 days fasting in the wilderness. And I want to read to you the, uh, the version of this from the Gospel of Matthew. So this is Matthew 4, verses 1 and 2. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. He fasted 40 days and 40 nights, and afterwards he was famished. The Bible also records Jesus' instructions to his disciples about fasting. And this is from Matthew 6 verses 16 through 18. And whenever you fast, do not look dismal like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces so as to show others that they are fasting. Truly I tell you, they have received their reward. But when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face, so that your fasting may be seen not by others, but by your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. So by the fourth century, various Christian communities had begun observing 40 days of fasting before the three holiest days of the year. So Holy Thursday, Good Friday, and Easter. And this became what we know as Lent. But what about a feast day before Lent? What about Mardi Gras? So it's, it's also not in the Bible. Now, Leviticus 23 does list seven feasts in order of their seasonal observance. So there's the Feast of Passover, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the Feast of First Fruits, the Feast of Pentecost, the Feast of Trumpets, the Day of Atonement, and the Feast of Tabernacles. Now, each of these feasts has its own specific instructions. But some required the Jewish people to bring offerings to the temple and then to feast there at the temple together. So Deuteronomy 12, 17 and 18 says this, Do not eat the tithe of your grain, your wine and your oil, the firstlings of your herds and your flocks, any of your votive gifts that you vow, your freewill offerings or your donations within your towns. These you shall eat in the presence of the Lord your God at the place that the Lord your God will choose. You, together with your son and your daughter, your male and female slaves, and the Levites residing in your towns, rejoicing in the presence of the Lord your God in all your undertakings. So when I learned about this feasting at the temple, it really changed my understanding of what the temple in Jerusalem was like. So yes, people went to the temple to make offerings. Uh, they also went there to receive forgiveness. But at times, they went to joyfully feast in the presence of God. And so the, place was a, uh, the temple was a place of worship 
and celebration. And I got to tell you, I love that. So in the book of Esther, we read about the establishment of another biblical feast, and that is the Feast of Purim. So Esther 9, verses 18 and 19 say this. But the Jews who were in Susa gathered on the 13th day and on the 14th and rested on the 15th day, making that, day of, making that a day of feasting and gladness. Therefore the Jews of the villages who live in the open towns hold the 14th day of the month of Adar as a day for gladness and feasting, a holiday on which they send gifts of food to one another. So Purim celebrates the defeat of Israel's enemies while they were exiled in Persia. And from the earliest days, rabbis prescribed that in observance of Purim, Jews were to drink lots of wine and then take a nap. Uh, it's a fascinating holiday if you want to Google it and, and read more about it. So the ultimate biblical endorsement of feasting comes from the prophet's vision concerning God's coming reign, the age to come, which the prophet Isaiah describes this way. On this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all people a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wines, of rich food filled with marrow, of well-aged wines strained clear. And he will destroy on this mountain the shroud that is cast over all people, the sheet that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death forever. Then the Lord God will wipe away the tears from all faces, and the disgrace of his people he will take away from all the earth. The Lord has spoken. Even Jesus himself, when describing the kingdom of God, compares it to a banquet or feast. Again, in the Gospel of Matthew, after sharing the bread and cup with his disciples, Jesus says this, I will never again drink of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. And this is a clear allusion to the heavenly feast of which the prophets like Isaiah spoke. Now, it's important to understand that when God's people eat and drink, we do so not simply for the sake of food and drink. Uh, in a wonderful article called The Lost Art of Feasting, Davis Mathis says this, Feasting is not first about the food. It is foremost about the Godward celebration of some specific occasion together. Good food and drink in abundance come in alongside our corporate focus to accentuate the appreciation and enjoyment of God and His kindness. For Christians, feasting is not the same as mere indulgence. There is nothing particularly Christian about eating and drinking more than usual. What makes feasting a means of God's grace for nourishing our souls is explicitly celebrating Christ together in faith. Whether it's things like Thanksgiving or Easter or birthday or an anniversary, when we feast as Christians, we celebrate the bounty and kindness of our Creator and Redeemer. So while the Bible allows for feasting and drinking, and it does, it places boundaries and limits on these practices that we should be aware of. Uh, first of all, they are to be done at prescribed times, they're to be done in community, and they're to be done in celebration of God's bounty. And listen, we have to take seriously the real dangers of overindulgence and intoxication. Uh, overeating can cause serious health problems, and it can become an addiction for some. Alcohol consumption can lead to alcohol abuse disorder and even alcoholism. And intoxication can lead to poor decision-making and lowered boundaries. Uh, if you've ever been in the French Quarter during Mardi Gras, you know what I'm talking about. And clearly, Christians must reject the parts of Mardi Gras that are exploitive and immoral. Despite what some think, many people on Bourbon Street are not having a good time. What I've seen is hurting people, trying to fill their emptiness with things that just cause more emptiness. It's like trying to quench your thirst by drinking salt water. But I want to be clear that what this calls for from Christians is not condemnation, it's compassion. And on that note, if you are a person who is struggling with addiction, maybe to food, to alcohol, or something else, if you're looking for what will truly fill you, I want you to listen for a moment. You are not alone. 
Uh, you are God's beloved child. Help is available. You can be well again. You can be whole. And I would just encourage you to reach out to someone. Reach out to me if you want to, and I would love to connect you with some helpful resources. So what does the Bible say about Mardi Gras? Uh, the Bible calls us to fast as an act of spiritual preparation. The Bible also prescribes feasts and feasting, encouraging people to eat and drink with joy and thanksgiving to God. But it really has no teachings directly related to Mardi Gras. So if you plan to feast and drink this Mardi Gras, remember the very real dangers, physical and spiritual, of overindulgence. Set boundaries and limits for yourself. Uh, feast and enjoy as part of a community and in celebration of God's bounty. And if you've got a problem, please reach out to a friend. Remember, for Christians, feasting is not the same as mere indulgence. When we feast as Christians, we do so to celebrate the bounty and kindness of our Creator and our Redeemer. So what do you think about all this? Uh, I want to leave some questions for you. Uh, maybe they can guide your thinking on this subject, or if you're watching this with a group, they can lead your group discussion. Uh, before I put those questions up, I do want to ask you, though, to please like and share this video. Help me to get word out about these, these uh, topics. And please like, subscribe, and follow First United Methodist Church of Baton Rouge on our social media platforms. See you next time, everyone.